Hello, and welcome to For Him Online Ministries. I hope you are having a wonderful day today. Here right now, it's Sunday morning. Looking forward here in a little bit to going to my home church and listening to my pastor, Brother Tony Howes, preach the Word of God. And uh, But anyway, uh, before I get into the message, there's a couple of urgent prayer requests that I have for you. The first one is my wife, Jenny. She's back in the hospital. She's needing surgery real bad, and that surgery is scheduled for September the 17th. And we're praying that either the Lord heals her or that the surgery will be moved up soon. And uh, she hasn't been doing good at all. And she's really heavy on my heart. And, just, and I'm not able to see her and visit her in the hospital. And so I ask you to really pray for us. And then the second prayer request I have, uh, such an urgent prayer request, and that is the nation of Afghanistan. We really need to lift up our brothers and sisters in Christ and lift up all of those that are in harm's way that help the U.S. government, the military, interpreters, uh, those that love the freedom of, of uh, freedom and been fighting freedom and fighting the Taliban and they are out to wipe out all those and uh, I believe uh, there were 15, close to 15,000 Americans in Afghanistan. And then a lot of Afghanist Afghanistan people, they're trying to get out of there because they know if, if they leave them there, they'll kill them. And I believe 9,000 a day is leaving Kabul airport. And we only have 5,200 troops left and they're right there at the airport protecting the airport. And uh, so we really need to pray for that situation. We need to pray. And uh, before I pray, uh, I want to ask all prayer warriors to join with us on August the 26th, this coming Thursday, for a day of prayer, fasting, and repentance for the nation of Afghanistan and for the nation of England, Afghanistan, over 39,961,315 precious souls. The nation of England, over 68,207,116 precious souls. And we are interceding that day, prayer and fasting and repentance. For those precious souls in those two countries that are lost. And we are also asking for protection, a head of protection, a code of protection around the saved and those trying to get out. And that they will all be able to get out. And the situation is really, really bad. Uh, from what I understand, the Taliban has already taken control of most of the country except for uh, the airport. And so we really need to pray for this nation. And I ask you to pray for my wife, Jenny. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus Christ. And Lord, I do pray for my wife, Jenny. I've been praying for her healing for seven years. I know that you are able, Lord. And I've been asking you and trusting in you that she will not have this surgery. There's preachers, pastors, and Christians all over the world praying for my precious wife. So, means so much to me. And Lord, I thank you for that. And Lord, I pray that she will have a full recovery, Lord. Oh, I just pray for my wife, Jenny. Help her through this time. And Lord, I pray for her. Now, I pray for the nation of Afghanistan I lift her up to you, and I pray for her. Oh, Lord, we do pray that souls will be saved in Afghanistan and England, and that millions of souls across America and around the world will receive Jesus Christ as their Savior before the rapture of the church, Lord. Oh, I believe it. I believe it. 
In Matthew 18, 19, Jesus said, It shall be done for them. And Lord, we are agreeing upon earth. And Lord, trusting in your word and trusting in you that this is going to happen. Now, Heavenly Father, I pray that I will move out of the way. Keith Watts will move out of the way. And the Holy Spirit will take full control of my mind and mouth, Lord, and my thoughts. And I pray that you will speak through me to the congregation, everyone that is going to listen to this and spread it all over the world. In Jesus' precious and holy name, amen. The title of the message is part one, is God's anointing power over your sermons and ministry. Is God's anointing power over your sermons and ministry? What a question. Each and every one of us preachers and pastors and Bible students need to ask ourselves, do we have the power of God, the anointing power of God all over us? And, and not just for our preaching and sermons and teaching, but for our everyday living. All So many years in the ministry, I was praying for power to preach but I wasn't praying for power to live. And we, boy, I tell you what, we need the power of God all over us, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The devil's as a roaring lion, roaming about, seeking whom he may devour. And I just, I just have this thought I want to share with you. I grew up around some powerful preaching when I was a kid. It was unbelievable. It has had an effect on me my whole life and my ministry. Even today, I can't stop thinking about it. And all this past week and today, going and studying over these messages, these two messages, I just uh, just kept going back in time to uh, some powerful preaching. I'll never forget the time that I personally met Brother Roloff uh, so one of my heroes of the faith, running a men and women's home in Corpus Christi, and I was able to preach behind his pulpit. I became the superintendent of the Roloff Home for Men for nearly six years, and and such a privilege. I remember the first morning I preached behind that pulpit. I was outside crying. <laughs> I was so moved by God, and what a powerful man of God I. I met him, I was, I don't know, probably 12. We were at a Bible college in Arlington, Texas, and he was there preaching to all the students and pastors from all over the Dallas-Fort Worth area, and also in Burleson uh, at a huge church. I heard him preach and heard him on the radio. And and uh, But the presence of God was all over this man. I just couldn't get over the presence of, of God uh, unreal. I'm, I'm reminded of Moses coming down out of, after speaking, after being with God 40 days and 40 nights. And the Shekinah glory of God was all over him. They thought he was a ghost. But I just, I just can't get over that. I can't get over the preaching of my uncle Jesse, uh, Jesse Simon, many, many years. I heard him many, many times. He influenced me so much. He taught me how to be a pastor. He had a pastor's heart. You don't teach that in Bible college. But when he preached, oh, the power of God was all over him. The power of God was all over his messages. The power of God was all over that auditorium. Every, it seemed like every time he preached, it, oh, I wanted it so much. I wanted it so much when I surrendered to preach in August of 82. And through the years, so many pastors and preachers uh, just Dr. John R. Rice, just a simple preacher, but the power of God. Uh, uh, Franklin Graham, he's one of them today, just preaching and having the power of God. Billy Graham, such a simple message, but what power moved the hearts of the people. Oh, and uh, Elijah, Elisha, Peter, Paul, Jesus. Some of them that I was thinking about as I was going over this yesterday. Just amazing. Never a man spake like this man in their response to Jesus Christ. 
I'm thinking of Charles Spurgeon, the prince of preachers. We call him, especially as Baptist. He was a Baptist in England. And uh, Jonathan Edwards, sinners in the hands of an angry God. You need to read that message. It will move your heart. It's unbelievable. Jonathan Edwards' style of preaching was he would write his message down on paper. Have that candlestick right there. It was dark out in the auditorium. They didn't have electricity. And he would read it. And then he would raise up for the altar call. And people would be holding on and grabbing hold of the beams, the wooden beams in that building. They were so afraid they were fixing to drop into hell right there. The power of God. Oh, and I, what I want more than anything as a preacher is the power of God over my preaching and over my everyday living and over for him online ministries and everything that I have to do for the Lord every day, the power of God. And so I want to take a look at the power source. I have here my phone, been charging it, it's charged up, but I have it here, and notice here's the plug-in right here. There's no power going to this phone. And in order to have power coming to this phone, you have to have the plug-in to go into the electricity. That is where the power is. And as I was putting this together a while ago in illustration, I got to thinking, oh, there's so many behind the pulpit today all over the world that is like this phone. The power of God is not in their preaching. It's not in their lives. And why is that? Ask the question, preacher. Why is the power of the anointing God of Almighty all over your preaching and all over your ministry? Why is it not there? Because you're not plugged in to the source. And I want to take a look at the four sources of power from the Word of God today, right now. And so let's take a look at it. The first one is the Holy Spirit, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 4 and 5, I want to read this. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit, capital S, in demonstration of the Holy Spirit, the God, Spirit of God, the God, God of the Father, Son, God of the Holy Spirit, in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. That verse wipes out most preaching today because man wants to speak his word. Man wants to speak his wisdom. Man wants to argue and try to persuade people. We can't persuade anybody. But I want to read the notes here, not with enticing words. Listen to this, not flowery or persuasive language, but the demonstration of the Spirit is necessary for truly spiritual preaching. And we'll take a look at that in verse 5 in a minute. But no, I always, most of the time, and I do every time before I preach, I ask the Lord to get Keith Watts out of the way. Keith Watts will hinder this message Keith Watts don't have any power. Keith Watts can't preach. He definitely can't preach with power from upon high. I'm just a man. I don't have any power. I'm a sheep. I, when I was pastor, I was an under shepherd. And, and the power, I want the power of God all over this message to convict the souls of men, to, to save the souls of mankind, to catch the preacher on fire, for Jesus, the Bible student, whoever it is, the pastor. And, and we find the Apostle Paul said he don't use enticing words. That wipes out most preachers of today, of the modern preacher. Wipes most of them out. And 
we find here that the apostle Paul said what he uses is a demonstration of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit moved upon the apostle Paul and preached through the apostle Paul. And why is that? In verse 6, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. You can persuade anybody and everybody you want and say that you win the argument. They aren't going to have the faith to get saved because faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And it takes faith for by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourself, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And we find here the Holy Spirit. And you can grieve the Holy Spirit. I was preaching at an annex jail in Corpus Christi. This is where the prisoners were held before they came before the judge. And one day I, one day I was preaching, took turns with my pastor and the associate pastor there at People's Baptist Church. So I had every third, third Saturday and we would go, I would go in and preach to them. And one day evil was all over that room, probably 15, 25 men. That's what it averaged around. And I had, did not have the freedom to preach. <clears throat> and after about five minutes, <clears throat> I fell down on my knees and I cried out to God, Oh God, remove the evil from this room. Give me the freedom to preach. And I pray in the precious name of Jesus to drive out this evil. And may the power of God come over me and convict these men. And I'm telling you, when I got finished that message, I stood up. I knew who the two men were. One was sitting at the very back over here. And one was sitting at the very back to my left. Less than a minute, one of them over here, he stood up, walked towards me, and walked out. In 30 seconds, the other one stood up, walked towards me, and walked out. When he shut the door, I said, thank you, Jesus. Now I can preach to you. Now I can preach to you with power from upon high. And I'm telling you, those 20, 25 men, they were going, what in the world? Because you know why? They knew that those two men were filled with evilness and the devils and demons, and they were causing havoc more than likely in their part of the prison. And those men listened very carefully, and I believe even one of them got saved, and the power of God came all over that room, and the conviction of God came all over that room. And I'm telling you, that's what this is all about, the power of God coming all over the preacher, power of God coming all over the sermon and the power of God, the, anoint, the anointing, the power of, of the Holy Spirit convicting the souls of men. And I want to take a look. We can grieve the Holy Spirit. And I believe for the most part, the grieving of the Holy Spirit is the one behind the pulpit. Oh, we need to examine ourselves and see if we are really, truly so many out there aren't even a part of God. And, and I want to say this real quick. Uh, this, the, um, uh, let me say, let me read a verse here before I, sh I want to share some notes about the Holy Spirit. But before I do that, I want to read John chapter 16, verse 13. Listen to what Jesus said. He's talking to the disciples and he gives them what the works of the Holy Spirit is. The works of the Holy Spirit. And when he, in verse 8, and when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. 9, 10, 11, he talks about those works of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit convicts us of our sins. The Holy Spirit is the one that draws us to Christ. We, those two things have to happen before we even receive Christ as our Savior. But listen to this, verse 13, how be it, this is Jesus speaking to the apostles, how be it when he, the spirit of truth, just a minute, I had, I get a little tear in my eye and I couldn't read. 
He will guide you into all truths. Listen to this. For he shall not speak of himself. Never will the Holy Spirit speak of himself. But whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. And listen to verse 14. He shall glorify me. He shall glorify the Holy Spirit shall always glorify Jesus. He will always glorify Jesus. For he shall receive a mind and shall show it unto you. He is always going to point to Christ. All around the world, people glorify the Holy Spirit, even sing to the Holy Spirit. He is our comforter. He seals us unto the day of redemption. He teaches us. He's our great teacher. Teaches us all truths. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> he will always do that. You look at these. You look at my messages. I, I mean, I will talk about the Holy Spirit. I'm talking about him right now. Because I'm preaching about him and about his works. But there are so many out there. That went, they'll, they'll have crusades and healing. They will have healing and prophecies. We need to start preaching the prophecies here. We don't need new prophecies. We need to preach the old ones. But, oh, let's stop having healing services. James said, if there's someone sick among you, bring them before the elders of the church. Lay your hands on them, anoint them. And pray over them. And if it's God's will, he will heal them. Let's start preaching the word of God. I find it so amazing that the world wants to see a miracle. They don't want to hear Jesus. They don't even believe in his miracles. Or they would follow him. They want to see a miracle. They don't want to hear the preaching of Jesus Christ. And then in uh, point number two, Christ. The power source is the Holy Spirit. The power source is Christ. Oh, there's power in the name of Jesus Christ. There's power in the blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, there's power. Oh, before I get into that, I want to read this in... Uh, and it's in my old Bible uh, that I preached for a long time. I got duct tape all over it and scotch tape on the inside. I want to read this, this study on the Holy Spirit. When David sinned against the Lord, he prayed, Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. In Psalms chapter 51, verse 10, I believe, uh, verse 11, he said that. In the New Testament, after Pentecost, we see the Holy Spirit indwelling the believer, never to leave him, filling and empower him, him for service. The study of the person and work of the Holy Spirit is of utmost importance. I agree with that statement. A scriptural understanding of God the Holy Spirit will make you a better Christian and servant of God. And I wanted to read that because I believe that. Oh, I tell you, we need you if you need to study a scriptural understanding of the Holy Spirit. Most religions, most denominations, most churches today are absolutely do not understand the workings according to the word of God of the Holy Spirit. Oh, I'm, I'm so wanting to teach on, on the doctrines of the Bible. But let's go to the second one, Christ. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 24, we're right here. Now all of a sudden my eyes aren't adjusting. Verse 24, 
But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Christ, the power of God. Oh, there's power in the name of Jesus. There is power in his name. But uh, I, I want to say this all around the world today and all across America today. You will hear the world preachers say the name of Jesus. So many of them will even heal in the name of Jesus, which is so amazing, and even prophesy in Jesus' name. But in Matthew, in the Gospels, Jesus says to them, <coughs> you prophesied in my name. You did miracles in my name. You have done many wonderful works in my name. Depart from me ye workers of iniquity. They never knew him as their Lord and Savior. They were ministers of the imitation of light. They come as ministers of light, and they have flooded Africa. They have flooded America, England, Europe, Australia, Asia, South Africa, North, Af North I mean, South America, North America, all the continents. All seven continents, they're all over. I deal with so, so many of them every day, nearly every day. And I just, and, and I, I deal with a lot of preachers and pastors that preach Jesus. But I feel so many of them are confused about the workings of the Holy Spirit according to the scriptures. It's always got to be according to the scriptures. But we find here, that it's got to be through Christ. And I find it interesting. I read to you, my, my text verse was 1 Corinthians 2, 4, and 5. But listen to verse 2. Here's what the Apostle Paul said before he said, uh, my speech and, and my preaching is not enticing words. This is what he said. For I determined not to know anything among you. What does he know? Save Jesus Christ and him crucified. The Apostles Paul's preaching was all about Christ. The Apostle Paul's preaching was all about the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. I'll, uh, I'll not uh, turn there. Oh, let me see. It's going to be on the next point. But the Christ is the power of God. That's what it said in verse 24. And there is power in the preaching of Jesus Christ. So many, most of these all over the world today, probably 95, 97, 98 percent of them. The reason why they don't have God's anointing power, they don't even have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Because you have to be saved to have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. You have to be saved to have him. He seals you into the day of redemption. I remember when I got saved at 10 years old, I knew the Holy Spirit was dwelling in me that instant. I knew. I felt him. I felt his presence. Oh, very quickly that later that day, I felt his convicting power, which is far greater than the conscience of the man far greater power there. And, uh, but I, I see here, the next one, the third one, is the gospel. The gospel. The most important thing on the face of the earth to preach is the gospel of Jesus Christ. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, <coughs> verse 32, I mean, uh, verse 3 and 4, I'll not turn there, but uh, I want to say, uh, well, first, let me read uh, Romans chapter 1, verse 16. Romans chapter 1, verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation for every one that believeth to the Jew first and also to the Greek. 
Oh, preacher, you want to have the anointing power of God all over your sermons. You want to have the anointing power of God all over your, your uh, ministry, all over you every day. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit inside of you. Oh, and it takes a prayer, massive and massive amount of prayer every day. To have the power of God all over you every day, but also in your preaching. Some of the preaching that the Lord has used the most in my ministry, I've spent massive amount of time on my knees. And as I'm reading the verses and I'm crying because the verses have grabbed a hold of me and turned me upside down, God had to speak to me. Oh, he had to speak to me. How in the world can we speak to the people if he don't even speak to us? But Romans chapter 1, verse 16, he said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Why? For it is the power of God. Oh, you want to have power over your messages. Preach the gospel. Oh, start having crusades. Preach in the crusades the gospel of Jesus Christ. So many around the world are gathering multitudes. You want to start having problems? You want to start having the authorities getting a hold of you and getting their attention at these crusades? Stop trying to perform miracles. Start preaching on sin. Start preaching on the gospel of Jesus Christ, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That multitude may run you out. But it's worth it. We need to preach Jesus Christ. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3 and 4, the Apostle Paul lays out the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The gospel of Christ, it is the power of God. It is the power of God. And very quickly, I want to read Galatians chapter 1, verse 6 through 10. There is no other gospel. That's what the Apostle Paul said in Galatians chapter 1, verse 6 through 10. I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. And that is what they are doing. They're trying to get the congregation, the multitudes, to focus on being healed. They need to be focused on their sin. They need to be focused on their condition that they're a moment away from dropping in hell. And so the Satan, Satan uses that. And he used his acts, all those miracles, all the miracles that Jesus performed. He doesn't use the verses where God, Jesus told them, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. He doesn't use those. But that's what happens. And the apostle Paul said that they're perverting uh, uh, and would pervert the gospel of Christ. And listen to verse 8 and 9. But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you for him to be accursed. And then he repeats the same verse again in verse 9. As we said, therefore, what I just said, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have preached, let him be accursed. Oh, I'm telling you, Jesus Christ was so much more harsh with the religious crowd and religion and perverting the word of God, the Old Testament. And he's a mad and, and it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. Jonathan Edwards got that from Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, I believe ch chapter 10. And the same thing with you. You got the multitudes there and you're healing every one of them. And but you're perverting the word of God. And God says a curse it to you 
That is when Jesus says, depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. I never knew you. Oh, it's very serious. And listen to verse 10. For do I now persuade men, or God, or do I seek to please men? For it, for if I yet please men, I shall not be the servant of Christ. What strong words the Apostle Paul had written here. Oh my goodness, what strong words. Are you out to please men? I'm telling you what, my message is don't please men. Just look at the views. <laughs> you know? You're going to have one of two reactions of the Word of God. My Uncle Jesse, Jesse Simon, always said this. Either you need to pucker up because they love you and they love the Word of God. They're going to embrace you. Or you need to duck. They're going to hit you. That actually happened to him one time. Preacher, look out. And he had to duck. A man had swung, was trying to attack him from behind after a revival. But anyway, so... We find here that the Apostle Paul repeat, repeated the verses in 8 and 9. Oh, I'm telling you, you want to have the power of God. You got to be plugged in to the gospel of Jesus Christ. You got to be plugged in to Jesus Christ himself. You got to be his. You got to be joint heirs with Christ. You got to be plugged in with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's got to be dwelling inside of you. You got to be a true born again Christian preacher. How in the world can you preach the gospel? How in the world can you preach the word of God when you don't even really know him and he don't know you? And then the fourth one, the last one, absolutely so important. Plug in to the source right here. The word of God. Oh, the word of God. Hebrews chapter four, verse 12. What a powerful, powerful verse. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the, of the thoughts and ten, intents of the heart of man. Oh, you could take any book in the whole world and get behind a pulpit and try to preach. There's no power in it. But you take the perfect word of God and that verse says, quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And it's piercing. It reaches to the soul. It reaches to the spirit. And when it reaches to that soul, to that spirit, it is a discerner of the thoughts and in, intents of the heart of man, of the mind of man. And it shows and reveals the man, his condition and his wickedness. The word of God. There is power in the word of God. The power of the source of the Holy Spirit. The power is of the source of Christ. The power is of the source of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the power is the word of God. Someone sent me a video in Niger from Nigeria, a preacher, the other day. So good. So good. I, I put it all over my WhatsApp contacts, especially the WhatsApp groups for all those pastors and preachers. I don't think too many of them watched it. If they started, they, they shut it off real quick. Dr. Abel, and you, I, I have a hard, uh, Damina, D-A-M-I-N-A. The preacher came and said, how do I be successful? And Dr. Abel is preaching to a huge church, very large auditorium, and it's packed. And it was so amazing. It was six minutes long. And it was so amazing what this true preacher of Jesus Christ, this true preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ said about how you have a successful ministry. He said, are you a politician? Are you a businessman? 
The preacher said, no, I'm a preacher. He said, well, how do you measure being successful in the ministry? Ministry has nothing to do with a politician or a businessman. Ministry is a calling. You're a servant of God. How to be successful. He said, you don't, how do you take your measuring stick and measure it? But what he said was so amazing and absolutely right on the mark and so true. You want to have a successful ministry. You want to have a successful sermons. Preach sound doctrine. He kept saying that. I hardly ever hear it. I preach it all the time too. Preach sound doctrine. Preach the gospel. Preach the truth. It's not about the cars, the flashy suits. It's not about looking good. And look at this preacher. And It's not about any of that. It is about preaching the true word of God. He kept saying, preaching sound doctrine. You want to have the power of the anointing of God all over your messages? Get saved. Get saved. And you'll have the power of the Holy Spirit indwelling you. Preacher, get right. You're grieving the Holy Spirit. We are not, the Apostle Paul said, grieve not the Holy Spirit. Maybe you're preaching the gospel. Maybe you are. But there's no power. Get your prayer life right. Get your heart right. Oh, he needs a clean vessel. God works through a clean vessel. Oh, get right. I'm telling you, preacher, preach the word of God. Preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you will have the power of God all over your messages. And if you get your heart right and you get your prayer life right, you're going to have the power of God and the presence of him all over you all the time. Every day, I hope and pray that you will do that. Oh, Heavenly Father, help us preachers. Preach with power from upon high. The ministers, the missionaries that are left behind in Afghanistan, they still got to preach. They still got to live for you. They still represent Jesus Christ. They need to be willing to die. And oh, Lord, I pray for that. I pray for them. And Lord, I pray for the ministers and missionaries in England that you will sweep revival across those ministers, pastors. Get a hold of us, pastors and preachers across America. Oh, I pray all of this in the precious and holy name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. May the Lord bless you. And you have a good day on Sunday today. Looking forward to hearing my pastor preach at Newton Baptist Church, our own church. If we can be of any help to you, prayer request or anything, send a, we have a, a connect card and just get a hold of us. Lord bless you. Bye-bye.